You all, most of you have been or you will be at IEP meetings where they'll talk about the five conditional areas. Those, in a sense, those are the areas. So the home living, the community care, direct leisure, jobs, and education. Your, your IEP team now is required to work with you and with your son or daughter in addressing those five, five transition areas. The question we did is, is, you know, schools will say, well, we're going to do assessments. We're going to do different forms of assessment. Then we're going to share that information with the IEP team, which is good. What I suggest is if the parent is unsatisfied that the assessment data isn't targeting the true needs of my child, then what you can do over time is simply, uh, let's talk about this sequentially. In home living, you follow the, the chart that you have in your packet. Home living, where is your son or daughter right now specifically a home living capacity or skills? Where is he or she with community participation? or rec leisure, jobs and jobs training, or education. And that education piece really becomes important because in a moment we're going to talk about pathways. And what we're going to create, I hope I can create with, with this discussion, is a visual image that you'll take away this evening. Because what you really are talking about at transition are pathways. And you have to, as a parent, determine with your son or daughter what pathway that's going to be. The key challenge is to ensure that students with disabilities have access to full participation in post-secondary education. We focus on the future. If we intend to truly provide productive outcomes for students with disabilities, then it's time to focus on the goal of transition. The focus begins with understanding the trans transition pathways. This is now where your discussion has to be. So if you're going to your next IEP meeting, if your, kid is, your child is on a transition plan, um, Think of, think of the pathways, which, which is really um, a focal point of your discussion. And Stephen Covey wrote a book several years ago. And in, in the book, on, um, he talks about you have, to, you have to start thinking about certain possibilities in life with the end in mind. So when you add a, you're at a transition meeting, what you really are saying to yourself is, where do I see my son or daughter when they're 22 years old? You start with that, that kind of framework within your mind, and then here, rather than reading all this to you, you start seeing what path the pathways model is really getting to. Here are the pathways. In life, you have four pathways. At those IEP meetings, you have four pathways. One is academic, meaning that that pathway is going to lead to college. So if you say at those IEP meetings, I believe, let's just say, um, I believe my child, would, whether my child has Asperger's, LD, or whatever condition that may exist, I really believe with certain accommodations, my son or daughter can be successful in college. We are going to create an IEP that is going to take my son or daughter in that direction or along that pathway. The second pathway, which is another really good option, is the career technical training pathway. You don't necessarily see your son or daughter getting a liberal arts degree, let's say, but they do have the capacity, the interest, and maybe the, the, um, the desire that they've already shared to maybe go to a vocational school. But always say, when you sit at an IEP meeting, how is my son or daughter doing on the pathway of, of leading towards technical, to a technical college opportunity or to a liberal arts opportunity? And then what you're going to do is you're going to have to look at that IEP and say, for instance, at that academic level, if my son or daughter is on the pathway to go to college, what's the most significant part of that IEP that you can make sure that, what, with the content of that IEP, what do you want to see in there? How many of your students have a standard-based IEP? And that's been required since 2004. Remember when No Child Left Behind was passed, all those standards were created. And what the standards were in the state of Minnesota is every child will achieve those standards, right? That includes our students with disabilities or with complex learning needs. So what the law said at the time was, we will write IEPs based on those standards. That's a standards-based IEP. Now, if you really want to annoy your IEP team, go to the next meeting and simply say, could you kind of point out to me where the standard-based IEP is? 
to where the goals are. <clears throat> because remember those goals, if my son or daughter's pathway is to college, what do you think the rigor of that math class should be? Should it be a low-level math class? Or should it be a math class that approximates the standards of a 12th grade student or of a 10th grade student? That's what you want. Now you're going to say, well, my, my son really struggles with math and he only has fifth grade capacity. Okay, he has fifth grade capacity in math, but where is that math scale aligned to the standards of a ninth grade student? And is that math only happening in the resource room or is it happening in the ninth grade math class? Because remember, the other part of the law said is that we will have a the greatest opportunity for our sons or daughters to be successful is to be included with all students, not to be necessarily removed. But you as the parent have to determine where that service is going to be happening. So let's say you, you, have, you, you say the pathway is academic. You have to then at that point make sure there's rigor in that IEP. Because that's the pathway, that's what you, you need to ensure. You also should ensure that the standards of that school system in the state of Minnesota are articulated in that IEP. So here's the standard in math. Here's the goal on how my son or daughter is going to help achieve or at least some of his work or effort will reflect that standard. The, other, the second pathway is career technical school. Employment does not necessarily mean the absence of going to post-secondary training. But it really is a pathway that could have possibilities for a lot of our, our, our sons or daughters. And then the final one is support setting where both rehab services may be um, what you'll have to access. And your IEP team should help you with that. So there you have the pathways. You as a, 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 a parent need to articulate to the IEP team what pathway is my son or daughter on. It now needs to be determined. And then somebody said to me, like, that pathway changes. Yes, it does. But somebody needs to bring it up. And, if, and if, this, if, if you bring it up and say it is going to be college, then you have to understand, and I've given you a lot of things to read tonight, that that's hard work, but it's still possible. And I've worked with hundreds of kids where we thought, especially students with emotional behavior disorders, they were, they were fun. But we actually were <laughs> successful in getting students, even of those on complex needs, of going to post-secondary schools. Because what we believed in at the time was they had the intellectual capacity to do fairly well. They, had, they were lacking the emotional capacity to do it better. So what we did is we dealt with their emotional needs. And some actually had gone on to school. All right. The pathways and levels of support. Here's self-determination. Has anyone talked about that in IEP meeting? That's the most critical need of your sons or daughters. What self-determination within, what do you think that means? Anyone? Where, where they get, how much they can actually put into this? How much they can yeah. decide what they? You know, it was funny, I was sitting, I was sitting with a student once and says, he was like 16 or 17 years old. He said, Pierce, that guy's probably a lousy teacher. He said, Pierce, that. I, I probably can't use his language. What in the heck is an IEP? He's been an IEP for eight years. And we never invited him to the meeting. You see, and then you think of self-determination. It's the capacity to understand perhaps who you are, what your strengths and needs are, and be able to some way articulate that. And you should be able to do that. So then what I thought is, okay, well, I wasn't very good at that point, but he was not know whatever his name is. He reminded me I wasn't very good. So we started inviting people, but then what was happening now, what's happening in terms of where do a lot of our kids graduate for? <coughs> what is the one skill they need after they leave school, whatever it might be? And I felt, and I really believe it's true now, it's that sense of either self-advocacy or self-determination. So one of the schools I was, I was uh, manager of special services for, we required that every student beginning in his junior year, we would create a portfolio. That portfolio was everything about that kid. 
that that student and the teacher put together themselves. The portfolio was really what he would use to introduce himself to a college or to introduce himself to a job site. And as those flip cameras became more um, prominent, we would start recording um, interviews or authentic learning with these students with their portfolios. And you understand, many of the students that we work with, they can't, they can't look at themselves initially when, you're video tape, when they have to watch themselves in video tape. They just can't. So that was our baseline. The student is lacking confidence of looking